Good morning, everyone. It's my uh, uh, privilege this morning to introduce uh, Professor Edmund Bershinger from MIT Physics Department. He's going to uh, talk to you today about uh, cosmological evolution and on Wednesday morning on biological evolution. So welcome, Professor Bershinger. Good morning. Thank you very much for that introduction. And thank you for hosting uh, my wife, Tatiana, and I in the beautiful city of Istanbul. We're very pleased and privileged and honored to be here to share with you some of our discoveries about evolution, both cosmic and biological evolution. I begin with a picture of the night sky that I was fortunate enough to see in January 2007 from South America. This photograph was taken from the Andes mountain range in Argentina. And it shows a bright comet, Comet McNaught. Shortly after sunset, this is a cloud of ice and, and dust and smoke, which has passed by the sun, heated and melted by the rays of our sun to form a tail, a magnificent bright tail millions of miles long in the inner part of our solar system. It takes light from that comet eight minutes to reach our eyes from South America. But you see also many stars in the nighttime sky, and a glowing band called the Milky Way. Because in places, it looks like milk has been spilled across the sky. When the telescope was invented and applied to the stars by Galileo over 400 years ago, Galileo discovered that this Milky Way, in fact, consists of many thousands of stars, like those in the rest of the sky. And while he did not know it, we now know that it takes light hundreds of years to travel to us from most of those stars. However, there are two bright stars, these two, Alpha Centauri and Beta Centauri, from which light takes only four years to travel to our eyes. These stars seem to have no physical connection, but they orbit each other with an 80-year period comparable to that of the outer planets in our own solar system. These stars are orbiting each other, and we see them in our own Milky Way. We also see two patches, two spots of milk, called nebulae. These are also called the Clouds of Magellan. If you ever have the chance to travel to the southern part of the Earth, Look up at night and see if you can find this glowing band, the Milky Way, and the famous clouds of Magellan, which look as almost as if they have been cut out of the Milky Way. They, too, are composed of many stars, but they lie much further away. Light from these clouds takes 180,000 years to reach the Earth. In one beautiful image, we see so much of the universe that it raises beautiful questions. What is this beauty? What are these things in the sky? Where did this come from? Are we part of it? Or is this somehow exotic and, not, and we are apart from the universe? And finally, where did we come from? I'll address these questions in the two lectures today and on Monday, on Wednesday. Now, at the beginning, I want to start emphasizing the vast scale of distances in the universe by showing you a video sequence from a video made in 1977. And could we have the sound, the audio in the booth, please?
The picnic near the lakeside in Chicago is the start of a lazy afternoon, early one October. We begin with a scene one meter wide, which we view from just one meter away. Now every 10 seconds, we will look from 10 times farther away, and our field of view will be 10 times wider. This square is 10 meters wide, and in 10 seconds, the next square will be 10 times as wide. Our picture will center on the picnickers, even after they've been lost to sight. 100 meters wide, the distance a man can run in 10 seconds. Cars crowd the highway, power boats lie at their docks. The colorful bleachers are soldiers' field. This square is a kilometer wide, 1,000 meters. The distance a racing car can travel in 10 seconds. We see the great city on the lake shore. 10 to the fourth meters, 10 kilometers. The distance a supersonic airplane can travel in 10 seconds. We see first the rounded end of Lake Michigan, then the whole great lake. 10 to the fifth meters, the distance an orbiting satellite covers in 10 seconds. Long parades of clouds, the day's weather in the Middle West. 10 to the sixth, a one with six zeros, a million meters. Soon the Earth will show as a solid sphere. We are able to see the whole Earth now, just over a minute along the journey. The Earth diminishes into the distance, but those background stars are so much farther away that they do not yet appear to move. A line extends at the true speed of light. In one second, it half crosses the tilted orbit of the moon. Now we mark a small part of the path in which the Earth moves about the sun. Now the orbital paths of the neighbor planets, Venus and Mars, then Mercury. Entering our field of view is the glowing center of our solar system, the sun, followed by the massive outer planets, swinging wide in their big orbits. That odd orbit belongs to Pluto. A fringe of a myriad comets too faint to see completes the solar system. Ten to the fourteenth. As the solar system shrinks to one bright point in the distance, our sun is plainly now only one among the stars. Looking back from here, we note four southern constellations, still much as they appear from the far side of the Earth. This square is 10 to the 16th meters, one light year, not yet out to the next star. Our last 10 second step took us 10 light years further. The next will be 100. Our perspective changes so much in each step now that even the background stars will appear to converge. At last, we pass the bright star Arcturus and some stars of the Dipper. Normal but quite unfamiliar stars and clouds of gas surround us as we traverse the Milky Way galaxy. Giant steps carry us into the outskirts of the galaxy. And as we pull away, we begin to see the great flat spiral facing us. The time and path we chose to leave Chicago has brought us out of the galaxy along a course nearly perpendicular to its disk. The two little satellite galaxies of our own are the clouds of Magellan. 10 to the 22nd power, a million light years. Groups of galaxies bring a new level of structure to the scene. Glowing points are no longer single stars, but whole galaxies of stars seen as one. We pass the big Virgo cluster of galaxies among many others, a hundred million light years out. As we approach the limit of our vision, we pause to start back home. This lonely scene, the galaxies like dust, is what most of space looks like. This emptiness is normal. The richness of our own neighborhood is the exception. The trip back to the picnic on the lakefront will be a sped up version, reducing the distance to the Earth's surface by one power of 10 every two seconds. In each two seconds, we will appear to cover 90% of the remaining distance back to Earth. Notice the alternation between great activity and relative inactivity, a rhythm that will continue all the way into our next goal, a proton in the nucleus of a carbon atom beneath the skin on the hand of the sleeping man at the picnic.
10 to the 9th meters, 10 to the 8th, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. We are back at our starting point. We slow up at 1 meter, 10 to the 0 power. Now we reduce the distance to our final destination by 90% every 10 seconds, each step much smaller than the one before. At 10 to the minus 2, 1 one hundredth of a meter, 1 centimeter, we approach the surface of the hand. In a few seconds, we'll be entering the skin crossing layer after layer from the outermost dead cells into a tiny blood vessel within. Skin layers vanish in turn. An outer layer of cells, felty collagen. The capillary containing red blood cells and a roughly lymphocyte. We enter the white cell. Among its vital organelles, the porous wall of the cell nucleus appears. The nucleus within holds the heredity of the man in the coiled coils of DNA. As we close in, we come to the double helix itself, a molecule like a long twisted ladder whose rungs of paired bases spell out twice in an alphabet of four letters the words of the powerful genetic message. At the atomic scale, the interplay of form and motion becomes more visible. We focus on one commonplace group of three hydrogen atoms bonded by electrical forces to a carbon atom. Four electrons make up the outer shell of the carbon itself. They appear in quantum motion as a swarm of shimmering points. At 10 to the minus 10 meters, one angstrom, we find ourselves right among those outer electrons. Now we come upon the two inner electrons held in a tighter swarm. As we draw toward the atom's attracting center, we enter upon a vast inner space at last the carbon nucleus, so massive and so small. This carbon nucleus is made up of six protons and six neutrons. We are in the domain of universal modules. There are protons and neutrons in every nucleus, electrons in every atom, atoms bonded into every molecule out to the farthest galaxy. As a single proton fills our scene, we reach the edge of present understanding. Are these some quarks at intense interaction? Our journey has taken us through 40 powers of 10. If now the field is one unit, then when we saw many clusters of galaxies together, it was 10 to the 40th, or 1 and 40 zeros. I had the privilege of having my office at MIT when I arrived next to the man who narrated this film, Professor Philip Morrison, one of the great science educators of the 20th century. And in that film, he showed the enormity of inner space and outer space with 40 orders of magnitude, 10 to the power 40, between the smallest things we understand and the largest. Now, almost 40 years later, we understand much more than in those days. We know more about the elementary particles of the smallest size, and we know much more about the universe in the largest. In this lecture, I'm going to focus on some of the simplest, and next time, on some of the most complicated objects in the universe. I've taken the length scale in logarithmic units of meters from 10 to the minus 15 meters at the bottom to 10 to the 24 meters at the top to show you some of the major objects and structures that were pointed out by Morrison in the film. Starting from our, our universe as a whole at the largest scale to galaxies. And you remember, as we took this cosmic voyage of stretching the scales, what a long journey it was from the size of a galaxy down to the size of a single star and star system with its planets. And then, many powers of 10 to the size of a human being, your president. 
Going inside of an individual, we get to subatomic, to, to molecular scales. We get to the scales of cells, single cells, the blood cells that were shown, the lymphocytes, to bacteria, to viruses, and then down to molecules and protons. In today's lecture, I'm going to focus on the largest objects, the, galaxy, the universe, the galaxies, and briefly on stars. Galaxies in the universe. I showed you this opening picture of the Milky Way, and you saw a spiral galaxy called the Milky Way in the video that Morrison narrated. Our modern knowledge about the Milky Way came from telescopic observations made by astronomer Edwin Hubble at the greatest telescope constructed in the 20th century, built in 1910, more than one century, 100 years ago, in Mount Wilson in Southern California. And Hubble, although it looks as though he's peering through an eyepiece to make the observations with his naked eye, in fact, is steering the telescope so that it will maintain precise alignment while a photographic emulsion, the old technology of photographs, was used to record the light from the nighttime sky. In the 1920s, Hubble made some important discoveries. First, he found that the Milky Way, which Galileo, 300 years earlier, had resolved into stars, was itself related to those clouds of Magellan and to spiral nebulae or patches of light in the sky which have appearance like these. These are all enormous star systems, thousands of light years across, and many of them millions of light years distant from us. In astronomy, we often speak of light years, the distance that light travels in one year, six trillion miles, because of the vastness of, of space. And so Hubble was able to look at these patches of light in the sky and recognize that they contain stars and they took very characteristic forms or shapes. Some of them were round and diffuse. Some had spiral patterns like this. Others had a, a spiral but with a bar in the middle. He didn't know what led to those forms, but since his time, we do. But Hubble made a second discovery. Ah, my I have to uh, bring this back up. I've just frozen. Good. Actually, let me say a bit more about the galaxies that Hubble studied. Since the century when Hubble began, we now have much more powerful telescopes, including an orbiting space telescope called the Hubble Space Telescope, named after Edwin Hubble, the astronomer of a century ago. And the Hubble Space Telescope has taken some very deep images, not using photographs, but using electronic detectors, similar to those in your cameras or cell phones, but much more sensitive. And in the, in the deepest exposure to see the faintest objects in the sky, everything that shows up is not a star, but in fact a galaxy. Not only millions, but even billions of light years away from our solar system. And when that image portion of it is enlarged, one can see on the right the patterns of these galaxies. They look a bit odd. Some of them are stretched. Some look like they're not fully formed. They're patchy or blotty. That's because these are galaxies so far away that we're seeing them after light has traveled many billions of years to reach us. And so we are seeing these galaxies in the past as they were billions of years ago. And what astronomy has taught us is the universe then was different from the universe now. But Hubble's greatest discovery made in the 1920s was that the galaxies are moving away from our own galaxy. And for the most part, they're moving away with a speed proportional to the distance. The little red arrows indicate that. If we're in the middle, the galaxies are all rushing away from us. But this is not unique to our own galaxy. If we stand on, let's say, this galaxy here, you'll notice this one is moving away faster. So relative to this, this one is moving away. And this is moving away in the opposite direction with a comparable, spe comparable speed. It's moving even faster relative to this. We could center this picture on any galaxy and find that the galaxies are all moving apart from one another. That's very odd. 
What does it imply? Well, first, if the galaxies are moving away from each other today, then yesterday they were closer to each other. Galaxies were closer together in the past. And one can extrapolate from this, from the measurements of the galaxy motions, to deduce that at some time in the past, 13.8 billion years in the past, all the galaxies were very close together. Now, our theories and observations say that they were so close together that they had to be compressed and the matter much denser than in a galaxy today. In fact, we believe that all the galaxies we can see in the universe today, stretching over billions and billions of light years, occupied a volume no larger than the end of your thumb, your thumbnail. That is what the universe was like 13.8 billion years ago. And so, as we know it, the universe began at this time. Remarkably, that age is three times the age of the Earth. Our Earth is part of this universe and part of its cosmic history. This also tells us something of fundamental importance. The universe changes with time. It evolves. Things are not the same, always. We can illustrate this on a time scale, which is also showing many powers of 10. In years from the beginning, when the universe was extremely dense but also very hot, the gas and the temperature more than 10 to the 9 or 1 billion degrees Kelvin. The degree Kelvin is the same as the degree Celsius or centigrade. And as the universe evolved in time, as the matter rushed apart, the density lowered and so did the temperature. Until 400,000 years after the Big Bang, the temperature had decreased to 3,000 degrees Kelvin. Now that's hot, but it's not much hotter than the temperature in the filament of an electric lamp, the old-fashioned lighting technology. That hot, glowing electric arc filament emits visible light, and so too the gas in the universe emitted hot vis visible light from the hot, glowing embers of the Big Bang. And we see that light, as I will show later. But after the universe cooled below 3,000 Kelvin, the gas stopped glowing. This room is filled with air. The air is transparent. If you were to heat the air in this room to 3,000 or 5,000 degrees Kelvin, it would glow like the filament of an electric lamp. But when the gas cools, electrons and protons and atoms and electrons combine so as to make the universe transparent. And for a long time, for millions of years, nothing much happened in the universe except a rushing apart of warm gas. But we now know that over hundreds of millions and billions of years, that gas began to condense into stars and into galaxies. In fact, some of those galaxies we see with the Hubble Space Telescope. And less than 600 million years after the Big Bang, the first stars formed, and they began to illuminate the cosmos in the time, the era that we call the first light. And since that time, stars and galaxies have been coalescing with matter increasingly forming into these large structures, bringing us to the present day, 13.8 billion years later, where the temperature in space is now very, very cold. I'm going to show another animation, this one of the process of galaxy formation starting from the Big Bang. This was a computer calculation done by a colleague of mine at MIT. In the first moments after the Big Bang, the first hundreds of millions of years, the gas already begins condensing or coalescing into these enormous filaments millions of light years across. We're now 1.5 billion years after the Big Bang.
2.5 billion years. The gas and matter is assembling into these galaxies and you begin to see little explosions in them. Stars form and black holes form. The bright centers of galaxies ejecting gas into powerful explosions in space. We're viewing the same volume of the universe looking at the matter, density, and at temperature of the gas, and you see enormous hot clouds of gas heated by the explosions of thousands of millions of stars and the expulsions of energetic jets of radiation. All of this, all of this constructed by computer simulation from our theories of how gas and matter work under conditions of gravity in the expanding universe. The stars which form create the chemical elements of the periodic table and they get spewed out into space. The stuff of life was created in those stars. Carbon was created in stars. We were created in stars. Eleven billion years after the Big Bang, we're approaching the present time. We take a journey looking at these clouds of gas and matter. And now, 13.8 billion years, we look at the whole simulation and zoom in just like that opening video clip I showed you. Powers of 10. From the largest scales, looking at the hot gas between galaxies, millions of light years across, we're going to zoom down into a galaxy created by computer simulation. The scale on the left, KPC, that stands for thousands of parsecs. A parsec is three light years, so we're now at a million light years across. 500,000 light years, 250,000 light years, 100,000 light years, a spiral galaxy surrounded by hot gas. What is so remarkable about this to me is that we now know the laws of physics well enough and can compute them to make a realistic simulation of how galaxies form. And those galaxies assemble into long chains in the universe. When we view them in the simulation, they look much like the galaxies of Hubble's observations one century ago. And in fact, this image shows the Hubble deep field from the telescope on the left and a simulation from this computer realization on the right. That was a remarkable simulation produced by Professor Mark Vogelsberger at MIT, heading up an international collaboration. Their calculations used millions of hours of computer time by running many thousands of computers in parallel in one of the largest computer calculations ever performed. This was a magnificent calculation, a tour de force published last year. Now I'm going to go down in scale further inside of the galaxies to ask about the formation of the stars themselves. And here we have to spend a few minutes about the observations of the stars and how we know what we know about stars. We learn about stars by studying the light, analyzing it into its colors. White light is composed of all the colors of the rainbow and passing the light through a prism of glass spreads the light. What we've discovered more than 150 years ago is that there are different kinds of light emitted by atoms in different phases. A hot, dense object will emit a continuous spectrum of all the colors of the rainbow. But a tenuous plasma or a thin gas 
will emit or absorb light at very characteristic frequencies or wavelengths corresponding to the different chemical elements. So when we look at the light from stars, what we find is all the colors of the rainbow, but with some areas where there's no light. And the reason why there's no light is because the outer layers of the star absorb, according to the chemical elements present in the star's atmosphere, hydrogen, sodium, calcium. In fact, the abundant chemical element helium, helium, is named helium because it was first discovered in a spectrum like this of our sun, Helios. And so by using this chemical analysis of light, we can find out much about the stars, their temperature from the range of colors shown, and their chemical compositions. This technique of spreading the light and analyzing it was devised more than a century ago, in the 19th century, and first applied to stars in the later part of the 19th century, where a group of astronomers, astrophysicists at the Harvard College Observatory were the first to analyze and study the starlight in great detail, looking at thousands of spectra of stars. These star classifiers were all women, and they included some names that today are very famous. Henrietta Leavitt actually was responsible for the key discovery that made Hubble's law, the Hubble discovery of the expanding universe, possible. She was the one who found how to measure the distances to stars. And Annie Cannon, this woman, analyzed the spectra of stars and discovered certain regularities or patterns and classified them. She classified them according to the spectral lines that were present of hydrogen, helium, carbon, iron, oxygen, silicon, and so forth. And the predominant color of the spectrum. She found that there were some stars which were very blue in color and had more blue light than red light because they were very hot, 30,000 degrees Kelvin at their surfaces. And those stars had strong lines of hydrogen and helium. At the other end of the scale, there were very cool stars, which were mostly red in appearance. She called these type M stars, but had many spectral lines, in fact, not only of atoms, but of molecules. And she recognized that these stars were very different. They had cold atmospheres, so cold that molecules could exist as in our own atmosphere. Although this is a little hotter than our own atmosphere, it's 3,000 Kelvin. <laughs> Remember that temperature in the early universe. Molecules can begin to form at that temperature. Astronomers Einar Hertzsprung and uh, Russell, Henry Norris Russell, plotted the surface temperatures coming from these colors against the luminosity of the stars, that is their power or their brightness, in a famous diagram called the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. And we can see our sun, Alpha Centauri, the bright star in the night sky, which is four light years distant, and many other stars with no apparent pattern. However, when you make measurements of thousands of stars, and I'm having a little trouble with uh, that, what Hertzsprung, Russell, and their followers discovered was some distinctive clustering of stars in this diagram, plotting the brightness of the stars versus their temperature. And it was soon understood in the 1930s, 1940s, and 1950s that these stars, along what's called the main sequence, are burning hydrogen by fusion in the core of the star, converting the lightest element, hydrogen, into the next heavier element, helium, with the release of enormous nuclear energy or nuclear power. When those stars converted enough of the hydrogen in their core to helium, they could no longer gain energy by burning hydrogen into helium. They had to fuse helium into heavier chemical elements, such as carbon and oxygen. And this is done in a stage of, of stellar life where the stars are called red giants or supergiant stars. 
They're giants because once the star burns away its hydrogen in its core, it has to use a much more energetic nuclear reaction of helium, which releases so much energy that the star has to expand in size and become giant. When our sun becomes a red giant, its size may be larger than the orbit of our own Earth. The Earth may be swallowed by the sun several billion years from now. And then finally, at the end of their lives, once the helium has been burned and, and the heavier chemical elements so that more, no, more, no more nuclear energy is available to the star, then the star may explode if it's very massive, spewing its chemical elements formed by this nuclear fusion process into space, as we saw in the computer simulation of the universe. Or the core of the star may just shrink into a, a dead cinder of cold, coldish. Here, 10,000 degrees doesn't seem very cold. This is a white dwarf. In fact, with time, these stars just get colder and colder and colder until they fade away into nothing. These are, these are leftover stars that are almost like planets. So we learn much about stars and their history from analysis of light. This research unlocked the secrets of the stars. Astronomers discovered that the stars must be powered by nuclear reactions and not by chemical reactions or burning of coal, for example, as, as one theory had it uh, almost two centuries ago. We found further that stars could not produce all the helium in the universe, even though they are efficient producers of helium. But they could not produce all the helium in the universe, and therefore the helium must have been produced previously. And now we know helium was produced in the first three minutes after the Big Bang. We've also discovered from analysis of stars that the stars don't live forever. Of course, some of them die in explosions that we see now in the universe. We estimate that our sun has lived over four billion years, and the best estimate now is consistent with the age of our solar system, 4.6 billion years. The brightest stars, though, live for a very brief time, three million years, brief in cosmic history, and so the first stars formed in the universe, we think, are of this type. They lived only a few million years before exploding and dispersing their chemical elements into the space around them. And it's good that they did, because we're not made of hydrogen and helium, the elements produced in the Big Bang. We're mostly made of carbon, oxygen, there's some hydrogen. Elements, the carbon and oxygen, sulfur, phosphorus, iron, those elements were produced in stars. And very importantly, we've learned from this study that just like galaxies and the universe, stars change with time. That is, they evolve. Now I'm going to show a snapshot, another little video sequence of star formation. With gravity doing what gravity does, which is to slowly pull it into vast clouds. Hydrogen is the simplest of gases but it has a very special property. It's a tremendous source of power. Heat hydrogen to around 10 million degrees and it begins to produce the energy that makes the stars shine and supplies the universe with warmth and light. To see how this works, let's imagine we could make a small star here on Earth. First, we need plenty of hydrogen gas. About a sports stadium full would be perfect. I think you have a football stadium next door. Next, we need to imagine squishing this hydrogen together, just as gravity does in space. As the hydrogen compacts, the atoms of gas start bouncing off each other the temperature begins to rise. By the time it's compressed down to the size of a soccer ball, the hydrogen reaches the critical 10 million degrees and a process called nuclear fusion begins. The hydrogen starts to fuse together, making a new heavier material, helium. With every step of this tiny bump and grind, 
some matter gets converted into pure energy. We have created a miniature star. Of course, if this was a real experiment, you wouldn't want to go anywhere near it. The energy given off, even from a star this small, would be devastating. Back in the early universe, the same process happened for the first time on a much, much bigger scale. Gravity compressed the hydrogen gas clouds over millions of years until deep in the center, the hydrogen became hot enough for fusion to occur. The first star burst into life, pouring its energy into the vast universe. A product of the laws of nature and the raw materials left over from the Big Bang. That dramatic sequence came from Stephen Hawking's universe, a video segment from the Discovery Channel in the US. It was not a real calculation. It was a Hollywood visualization of what it would be like to produce a star in a football stadium. You may know that scientists and engineers are trying to tap the power of stars through the process of nuclear fusion for future energy production. And one of the great challenges is how to contain such hot gas so that it doesn't explode out of the football stadium in the way that happened in this clip. But by studying all these processes, we've learned a great deal about the universe, its stars, its galaxies. We've learned that stars, galaxies, and the universe all change with time. They evolve. We've learned that we understand the laws of physics and chemistry of nuclear engineering well enough to understand in some detail these processes. And they lead us back to this beautiful picture of the sky, of the heavens, our Milky Way, the clouds of Magellan, the comet orbiting the sun, and our own rocky Earth to ask the deep questions about the origins of it all and our place in the universe. In my second lecture on Wednesday, I will talk about the evolution of planets and of life itself. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>